We can time each other, right? Yep. Said this many times and no one listens because no one knows how to do it. I'm a fan of structure and organization and line by line debate. If you don't do it, that's on you and I'll do whatever happens. Resolved, the United States federal government should enact the 21st century Glass-Steagall Act, Senate Bill 1709. Resolved, the United States federal government should enact the 21st century Glass-Steagall Act, for Senate Bill 1709. The plan is the resolution. Advantage one is multilateralism, subpoena is uniqueness. One, the Glass-Steagall Act was used to keep investment and commercial banks separate. Uh, however, it was originally made uh, basically obsolete by the Reagan administration and, when, and then was formally repealed by the Clinton administration. And then it uh, eventually caused the 2008 financial crisis uh, because, um, it, because uh, then the two banks uh, basically merged and, um, and, and investment banks uh, were able to make risky investments uh, on um, on uh, debt finance, we're able to use uh, debt finance act. We're able to make uh, risky investment, uh, risky investments on debt finance activity, um, and then collect insurance on failed investments uh, based on uh, the uh, insurance of commercial banks, uh, which basically created a bubble that eventually popped, causing the uh, 2008 financial crisis. Uh, now, Senator, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who has uh, proposed the uh, updated 21st uh, Century Glass-Steagall Act, has uh, claimed that uh, big banks are now 30% bigger uh, than they were five years ago, and that these high-risk practices are still continuing. Um, they are uh, creating uh, riskier investments than ever before, and uh, on these consumer invested funds uh, with this uh, debt finance activity, and they are continuing to do so specifically because nobody uh, was formally punished uh, after the 2008 financial crisis, and this is going to continue in the status quo. Now, um, second, um, other countries uh, have uh, recognized that this uh, 2008 financial crisis was caused, uh, specific, uh, like they have recognized that it was caused because uh, there is no split in our uh, investment and commercial banks. Many other countries have a split in their investment and commercial banks, uh, particularly like the EU has a separation in these uh, two banks, but the United States does not, and they recognize this difference. Um, now, uh, second, uh, this uh, it especially uh, causes uh, the fact that the United States is not uh, done anything about um, the, the causes of the 2008 financial crisis has uh, caused uh, kind of a decrease in, uh, in U.S. hegemony because we argue that um, our, our economy is key to our hegemony, uh, particularly because um, uh, particularly because uh, the United States dollar is uh, the reserve currency internationally. However, the IMF just approved uh, the Chinese yuan as the uh, as a, another potential reserve currency, uh, and uh, the the U.S. dollar being a reserve currency gives us um, an economic privilege that we have been able to enjoy. However, the fact that the uh, IMF has approved the yuan uh, as a reserve currency shows that uh, it's giving way to uh, multi economic. Uh, it, it is giving way to uh, multipolarity internationally. Now, this uh, shift, uh, this. Uh, decrease in U.S. hegemony uh, is caused by a shift to liberalism, which is self-imposed, um, uh, because of um, the, which because of a. Uh, shift away from realism in uh, United States foreign policy. Now this is caused by a uh, lack of, um, uh, this is caused by a uh, lack of, um, yeah, of, of realism in United States um, foreign policy, particularly with uh, dealing with other nations uh, like China. We can see uh, that this is because uh, the United States is uh, refusing to recognize that realism is inevitable in foreign policy. Uh, we can see that this is inevitable uh, when we look to uh, nations like China when they deal in, cur in currency manipulation. Uh, for example, China recently did another round of letting the yuan devalue, uh, which means that it makes their currency cheap, which makes their goods cheaper, which means that they are more competitive uh, against United States goods. Um, which means that uh, that uh, United States uh, sales go down. Uh, it's it's just one big economic battle. Um, so then, uh, next, uh, multipolarity. Uh Yes, so multipolarity leads to hegemonic ambiguity, which means that uh, other nations are able to challenge the United States, uh, not only economically, but also militarily, especially as China is uh, looking to match our defense spending by 2020. Um, it shows that uh, China is just ready to take, uh, is, is pretty much uh, ready to make a bid for hegemony against the United States. 
Um, now, hegemonic ambiguity means that uh, second tier states are, uh, in times of crisis, uh, would uh, not look to the United States but would also look to China. Uh, so, in times of crisis, uh, they would um, not necessarily just look to the United States, they could also uh, potentially back them, which means that. Uh, which means that especially like as the United, especially as like uh, Japan as our ally has reinterpreted their constitution, uh, there's uh, it shows that they are not necessarily confident that uh, the United States has the ability to um, uphold security guarantees, uh, things like that. So this hegemonic ambiguity is not very good for the United States. Now next, uh, this uh, means that it undermines all global diplomatic efforts for the United States as a hegemon. Next on to the impacts. First, multipolarity makes cyclical war inevitable uh, because while well, a unipolar hegemon is able to um, ward off um, interstate war, uh, for example, where it, in the 1990s um, there's the lowest rate of interstate violence, uh, where the United States was the uncontested unipolar hegemon, the the low the where it, it was the lowest uh, rate of interstate. Um, Lowest rate of interstate violence. Uh, the time, the most destructive periods of human history, like World War One, World War Two, wars of religion, um, those uh, all happen in times of multipolarity. Second, transition wars make uh, the deployment of nuclear weapons inevitable, which uh, seriously risks extinction, especially uh, with uh, China, Russia, and uh, the United States and many other nations also having nuclear weapons. Um, it pretty much uh, and realism is inevitable uh, in foreign policy. Realism says that states are going to do whatever they can um, in order to protect their own state. Uh, uh, that means that uh, the deployment of nuclear weapons is highly likely. And then third, Russia and China are going to do whatever they can to fill the power vacuum if the United States um, in a world of multipolarity has to step down as the uh, unipolar hegemon. Next on dissolvency. First, this bill requires banks to hold more capital as uh, cushions against losses. So that means that they have to stop doing these debt financed um, uh, investments. So five out of the six biggest banks are going to have to break up. Second, this means it's key to our international position because Greece and the Philippines specifically um, are uh, are asking us to uh, in, uh, to put into place the 21st Century Glass Steagall Act. Third, 2008 hurt us originally, so another recession would uh, cause people to take. Uh, the yuan seriously as a reserve currency, which could seriously boot us out of that economic privilege. And fourth, we argue that hegemony is key to our international diplomacy, which means that uh, it's far more likely to push us out of that position of power as a uh, unipolar hegemon and into multipolarity. which is the Stream Act has uh, passed the House. It will undercut Obama's efforts to uh, to update environment standards for uh, coal mining and mountaintop removal mining and delay implementation of these regulations for three years. Um, specifically, Mitch McConnell said on January 2nd that he's been uh, trying to sway Democratic votes. Second is that this, if this passes, it's a question of the almighty veto. McConnell says that he has enough votes, so it's left to uh, so it's less up, left up to the veto. Third is that moderates remain on the fence. Uh, this prevents two thirds. This prevents the two thirds vote required to with, uh, overthrow the veto. Uh, Susan Collins, a leading uh, moderate representative or Republican, opposed the bill specifically. And two weeks ago, uh, Republicans were 14 votes shy to override uh, the Water Act. So the links are first: is that uh, the plan is liberal and angers Republicans. Uh, it is viewed as an economic regulation, which leads to a decrease in investor confidence, which causes the GOP uh, to drastically oppose it. Second is that uh, the plan angers moderates because Suzanne Collins won't work with uh, Democrats here, but other uh, Republicans have criticized McCain uh, for supporting it. Next are the internal links. First is that passage allows for the practice of mountaintop removal uh, to uh, mountaintop removal mining to continue. Uh, and this is the equivalent of 6,500 miles that are at risk of stream pollution from this. 
and the plan accelerates this uh, like on a panic movement. Uh, second is that this pollution uh, this pollution hurts or kills the environment. It kills uh, carbon and nitrogen in the environment specifically, and it's killing the Appalachians, which are said to be uh, an, unri an unrivaled hub of biodiversity by scientists, saying it is one of the most biodiverse places in, in the world, uh, with uh, 198 endangered species currently. So next to the impacts first is a, a collapse of biodiversity, leads to a collapse in the environment because we are so uh, closely intertwined and connected. We never know which species that will go extinct uh, may end up like causing human extinction as well because we are so closely intertwined. Second is that a collapse of the environment, uh, or yeah, uh, and then third, or sorry, second is that this turns the case because a collapse in the environment uh, like will lead to like a freak out by all countries. So like in the midst of the collapse in the environment, uh, that would lead to like their impact. So the second disadvantage, a is that financial markets are stable but extremely close to the edge of collapse. First is that uh, David Einhorn, who, who runs uh, an $8 billion Greenlight Capital, in his second quarter letter to investors claimed that the market's rapid advance in the face of challenging earnings backdrop is creating an unstable condition for financial markets. Overtrading in a period of low earnings means that the securities are beginning to devalue. The result has been a drastic reduction in long and short-term portfolios by some of the biggest investment firms in an attempt to ride out future volatility. Second is that the business monitor uh, in business Business Monitor International uh, has a reduced prediction for U.S. economic growth from 2.1% to 1.8%. This means that the reduction in growth uh, created cautious investing in, in financial markets. Third is that bond yields uh, increased sharply in Japan and European countries. Uh, the Japan government bond almost crashed during uh, the second quarter as Japanese benchmark 10-year uh, bond yield with, uh, had hit 1% because, uh, this because of this, most investors suffered a loss in the second quarter and uh, international investment drastically dropped. Fourth is that the Shanghai Composite uh, Index fell sharply to 1849 levels, of, and this is the first time since uh, January in two, of 2009. This, they have only, or they only slightly recovered by by the end of that quarter. Uh, this shows an increase in volatility of the market. B is that the plan stabilizes markets. First is the plan leads to a massive loss of investment in these financial uh, in these financial markets because uh, they see it as like not a payback on investment. Second is specifically these provisions that prevent member banks of the Federal Reserve from security trade means means that 38% uh, of banks can't engage in financial markets. This leads to a collapse of the market because uh, like specifically uh, these companies in this market had led to uh, $100 billion like of profit just in the last year, which means as soon as you pass the plan, you know that that $100 billion is just gone. Third is that such a shock means that the, they will halt ongoing or outgoing investments. Um, to minimize their losses, which also hurts the market even further because it will pull out of investment. C is that a uh, failure of markets is catastrophic. First is that the plan destroys market. Uh, it's already extremely volatile, and they are increasing the uh, the amount of investors that are not only uh, like pulling out of the market, but also that one hundred billion dollars is going to be uh, lost, and that leads to uh, an investor like panic. Second is that financial markets represent over three hundred trillion dollars in wealth, which is more than the entire uh, the GDP of the entire globe, and that's going to just completely uh, wiped out. And third is that this devastating the economy because there's no alternative market for a uh, commodity exchange uh, internationally. So because there's no alternative market, there's no way that we can actually uh, do this with an exchange of capital, which means uh, like fourth, there is an, or which means fourth, this leads to, uh, or like D, this leads to resource wars because there's no other way that we can get these resources and these commodities. So we are going to uh, do what we think we have to to get them, which means we're not going to trade capital, but we're going to uh, start bombing people who are using nuclear war, which leads to extinction because of uh, things like uh, like nuclear fallout, which will, uh, which will kill a majority of the population as well as genome mutation which keeps us from being able to repopulate uh, which means uh, extinction of the human race. Next is the counter plan. Plan text is the United States federal government should enact the Glass-Steagall Act with the exclusion of all provisions that prevent member banks of the Federal Reserve from security trade. USFG shall enact the Glass-Steagall Act with the exclusion of all provisions that prevent member banks of the Federal Reserve from security trade. First is competition. This is uh, yeah, go for Sorry, it. can we get a copy of that and what's the status of the counterpoint? It's conditional and yeah, you can get a copy of it. Yeah. So first is the competition. This is mutually exclusive. They can't like simultaneously pass the entire Glass-Steagall Act and class it and pass it without enacting these provisions. Uh, second is you should evaluate their own through net benefits, and the net benefit in this case is that we are going to be uh, avoiding the disadvantage because we're still allowing security trade, which triggers it. Uh, second is solvency. First is that the specific uh, like these specific position p provisions disallow member banks of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, this includes all national banks from affiliated in any way with firms engaged in securities underwriting, exempt, er, exempting these sections 
sections, the sections that do this solve the affirmative because banks will still be subject to commercial and investment bank distinction, which is literally all the PMC talks about. Uh, so national banks that are exclusively investment banks can still engage in investment banking practices. Basically, this prohibits national banks from maximizing investment by establishing sub subsidiary firms. And then second is the account plan also avoids the financial market net benefit because it allows federal reserve banks to participate in the trading of securities and add to the level of liquidity, whereas the plan would just forbid 38% of banks in the U.S. from participating in securities trading. Uh, now let's go specifically to the affirmative. That question, sorry. Last what's, one, yeah. What's the reason for why it doesn't allow 30% of banks to, to engage? Because we take away the provisions that stop them from a uh, security trade. That's specifically what uh, the PMC uh, excludes that 38% by doing. So on the PMC, um, so, on their argument about how the U.S. has not done anything about the economic crisis and how that is hurting U.S. hegemony, first of all, that's absolutely not true, right? Like, this isn't, uh, like, the, the sole determinant of what U.S. hegemony is. We still have one of the strongest naval forces in the world. We still have one of the strongest air forces in the world, and we have a massive amount of ground troops, right? So, like, we're still, obviously, like, a very uh, huge hegemon. That argument underneath that that says that we cause a, a self-imposed shift to liberalism and that we are ignoring realism versus the counterplan solves us because we uh, embrace realism and we, and we just... Uh, and kind of like also because we embrace realism, we just stop this 38% of banks from not being able to trade anymore. What's that? Uh, yeah, you need to get the solvency and show how they don't. Have, they never show how they're like de uh, increasing U.S. hedge. They never articulate a solvency point for that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's go to solvency. First is they're never telling you how they're actually increasing U.S. hegemony. That doesn't actually happen. Second of all. Um, like challenge is going to be inevitable whether in a, whether we're in a system of multipolarity or unipolarity because uh, people like uh, chi like people like China and Russia will always want to be the unipolar power. So even if the U.S. is the current hegemon, they will still challenge us on literally any basis. They are also planning on uh, yeah. What's that? Yeah, their only warning is like Greece and the Philippines. They're not the entire international community. Yeah, Greece and the Philippines aren't the entire international community. Challenge is inevitable. and the second one is the financial markets to sad. Stream Act and financial markets. Yeah. So you want to go to Stream Act first? Yep, and then financial markets. Statement of Glass to Gaul economic collapse is inevitable. This means that we're controlling the uniqueness on both of the disadvantages because if economic collapse is inevitable, then it means the impacts of environmental problems will be caused in a world of economic collapse because uh, you can cross by our articulation that it makes war more likely and war is extremely bad for the environment on the financial one. What we are saying is that the markets are inherently unstable, they're inherently going to fail absent the reinstatement of Glass de Gaulle, which means that we're controlling the uniqueness as well. Their first argument on the line by line is that the United States still has hegemony through hard power. They give examples of this, but they ignore our articulation that economic power is the internal link to hard power. The kind of things that they're talking about are ridiculously expensive. They uh, state our Navy, for example, but they ignore the fact that aircraft carriers literally cost millions of dollars each. There's no way for us to maintain our, uh, our hard power without, um, uh, without maintaining our economic power beforehand, which means the affirmative team is an internal link to this, and it means inevitably in the world of an economic collapse, that hard power would decrease as well. That's the story from the PMC. They say the counterplan solves because it embraces realism, but the counterplan uh, is not able to solve that for this. The most important reason for it is going to be that it's not perceived in the international community the same way that the affirmative plan and the counterplan looks like a way to essentially gut it out or to make it less impactful, but what the international community wants to see is strong change happening. Uh, this is the articulation that we talk about when we give the examples of 
of Greece and the Philippines. They say later that Greece and the Philippines aren't an example of the international community, but you can cross apply our analysis that the EU already does this and is pressuring us to do it as well. They've already advanced this practice, and they're wondering why the United States hasn't taken action to do the same. These are all reasons why the United States needs to uh, needs to take the uh, reenact the entirety of Glass de Gaulle. The next argument they say is that challenges are inevitable. This ignores our story that challengers only have the guts to challenge the United States and the world in which they feel as if they have a chance. Cross apply, the realism, realism is inevitable. This means that countries act in their own interest. It's not in your interest to challenge somebody that can stomp you, but it is in your interest if you see a hegemon feeling to begin trying to increase your standing relative to them. This is where we get our impact of transition wars and they ignore our analysis here. You can pull across our first uh, our first impacts that ambiguity makes war inevitable uh, inevitable. This means that in the world of the negative, there's no chance to solve back of this. You can also extend across our Sorry, our third solvency point that says that 2008 uh, was a major blow to the U.S.'s position worldwide as well as to our reputation. These are reasons why the affirmative is essential to solving for hegemony. Go to the counter plan, please. Um, my first argument on the counter plan is a theory. The interpretation is that when there's a single legislative option, the negative team does not get a pick. Again, when there's a single legislative option, the negative team does not get a pick. The violation is that they choose to run a pick in this round. The standards are first predictability. There are literally hundreds of pages in this bill, and they could choose any provision within it to pick out of, and then claim some minor impact from this, and argue that that's a reason to vote down the affirmative. It's impossible for the affirmative team in 20 minutes of preparation to go through all hundreds of those pages of Moreover, uh, yeah, the second argument that I have is that the the the, the for, this is also essential to checking. If they're not allowing this, it's essential to checking back for the negative bias in debate. For example, the negative teams win a far higher percentage of out rounds at debates like the MPTE, which means that giving the affirmative team uh, flexibility on this question is essential to checking back for that. And equity between the two sides in debate is essential for maintaining the uh, essentially participation in a debate. If you always lose on the negative, or if you always lose on the affirmative, then really there's no reason to continue competing because you know you're going to be forced into being the affirmative. Yeah, the last thing I want for this is the voters. The uh, first is that you should consider this an all-priority issue. The question of how we engage in the debate always comes before the content of the debate. And the second uh, argument that I want here is competing interpretations. We're giving you an articulation of why in this specific circumstance you would not allow the negative team a plan-inclusive uh, plan counter plan. They need to prove that it's essential in this round, and they will not be able to do so. There's plenty of other counter plan ground that they could have uh, that they could have used. The uh, yeah, I'll take your question. Yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of confused on like what competing interpretation means on a pick's bad theory. I've only ever heard that on the T. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, it just means that you should provide a counter interpretation. Right. We'll weigh the interpretation that's against each other based off of the standards. Sweet, thank you. Just make a Go to the first disadvantage. Actually, I have another theory for this disadvantage. The interpretation is that the, uh, the uh, in order to run a politics, the bill must be on the docket. Again, the bill must be on the docket. The violation in here is as of this morning, GovTracker lists that there are no bills on the current docket. Again, they say there are no bills on the current docket, but the, the negative team gets up here and acts as if this one is. The standards, the first standard here is literature-based. There's no literature base for who will vote which way on something that is like, um, essentially steady until the until the bill has actually been introduced to the floor. That's when the votes start queuing up one way or another in a way that's per, like easy to predict, to predict and to see. And when they force debates without a literature base, this is uniquely bad in Parley because it allows us to get up and assert uh, things. The second standard is going to be that there are literally infinite number of things being considered in the Congress, but we don't like the, so there's a question of predictability. If we use the docket as a bright line, it creates a point of stasis that both sides can agree on, which allows us to have clash because we're able to both look at the docket and see what the potential politics arguments that we could be dealing with are. The voters here are going to be first that this is an all priority issue. Again, you cross apply my articulation about why theory comes first in the round. And the second, uh, again, you can cross apply their competing interpretations articulation. My next response to this uh, argument is uh, non unique. Uh, the, of the Freedom Caucus within the House is never going to give in, uh, has literally stated they will not give in to anything that they uh, view as 
Obama Center. They state that this bill, the, the Clean Stream Act, is essentially environmental regulations that Democrats have been pushing for, which means the Freedom Caucus is always going to block it anyways. Uh, the next uh, thing I want you to do is to drop down to the impact level. They don't give you an actual scenario for this biodiversity collapse. There's no keystone species that they outline. They leave it extremely vague, and they claim that environmental collapse turns the case, but I would argue that economic collapse turns the environment, because in a world of economic collapse, we always will be forced into prioritizing profits over the environment because the profit uh, levels will be decreasing so much that we feel as if it's essentially try or die for our economy. Moreover, cross apply my analysis about why war uh, changes the scenario. Go to the second disadvantage. First is a non-unique, the, uh, the, pur uh, the Purchasing Managers Index, uh, which is a, like an index of different investments and in business uh, investors and businesses' opinions. As predictive indicators of production and output are up 2% in December. Moreover, the overall index is up to 48.2 from 48% uh, from the 48% 40, that it was previously. This demonstrates that investors are confident in the status quo and you should prefer the Purchasing Managers Index over the different articulations that they give them because it's specific not only to the United States, but it also asks the investors about their description, the, uh, to be descriptive about their current position, as well as predictive about where they feel the market will be soon. This means that investors are saying they believe the market is good. The next argument I have is not unique. The Federal Reserve recently increased its interest rates. It signals that the Federal Reserve is confident about the state of the U.S. economy. The next uh, argument that I have is a trend that we actually increase comp the ability for com competition by breaking down monopolies. This means that these, business, these banks would be better able to engage uh, post plan. The order is going to be the uh, politics disadvantage. So the uh, Stream Act disadvantage, yeah. as we titled it. Sorry. Um, the Stream Act, and then I want the counter plan. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I want the Stream Act case counter plan, and then the financial markets disadvantage. Case will be in order of the Stream Act case counter plan. Mm -hmm. Stream Act case counter plan, financial markets. Okay. Um, I put all of your theory shells on the top page, on the top of the page, on every page that you read a theory on. If you float theory on a separate page, it will be before the disadvantage the counter plan proper. Sorry about that. I was low on paper. So no, it's cool. It's fine. Um, I mean, I generally float theory on the counter plan sheet too. Yeah. So, uh, you should. But that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, and then, just so you, just so we're all clear, case will be in the order it was read in the MG. Is everyone good? Cool. On the Stream Act, the first thing I want is the counterinterpretation uh, with the politics. Uh, in order to read a politics, the issue needs to be being discussed in uh, American politics today, not necessarily on the docket, just, you know, kind of people talking about them. Uh, thus, we do not violate because people are obviously talking about this topic. It's a resolution at a debate round. The answer your standard issue first. You said lit based because, like, there's not a lit base for, like, who will vote on it. What are you talking about? Politicians come out and say whether or not they support things all the time. People are already va uh, vying behind Donald Trump building a wall around Mexico. That's not on the docket because he's not even president yet. It's just a matter of, like, who does support it and who doesn't. That argument just has no, uh, uh, Value the next argument you say is predictability because like it's kitty clash. We are not unpredictable in this because the Stream Act has been has been being discussed for roughly over a, for over a year now. In fact, uh, if you never extend it, whenever you look at the first uniqueness argument, we show that the House has already passed this last year in a sense of how it's it's completely predictable because it's a question of whether or not whether or not Obama is going to go with it. Uh, next on your uh, vote on to answer your voters first of a priori, all you do is cross apply it. Uh, this is not a priori issue because you don't really articulate any sort of like abuse in the round. You don't articulate how how we're collapsing debate. So this is simply not a priori. But the second argument you say is a competing interpretation. Says cool. That means if you evaluate my interpretation, then the argument doesn't fall. But the uh, next argument I want, though, is the standards for reason for ours, because uh, we're allowing for a debatability in a sense of how, so whatever, in a world where you're not uh, allowed to really politics diss that, then it's just going to continue to push negative people out of the, uh, negatives out of the debate, out of the debate space. But second is because of ground, because uh, we are key to negative ground, because whenever you're just limiting another argument, that's just another tally you can put on what exactly someone can't read in a round that's bad for debate. The voters on that are ground and predictability uh, that you can just, I guess, use your same warrants on that, but also fairness, because we're, you're not restricting what we can read on the diss proper. You say it's not unique because the House is not going to give in. Extend across the first uniqueness that the HR 11344 has already passed the House. I don't know where you're getting your analytics because it is dated. But the second argument that you say is that like there's no scenario for biodiversity. Cool. Extend that. We're not going for this impact scenario. You say that the economic collapse turns the environment, but that's too bad if you're affirmative. It doesn't solve for economic collapse. That's what I'm going for. Go to the case. 
On the case, you say the first off, uh, you say first that uh, we're not perceived the same way because, like, the, uh, because the international community will not necessarily like view it the same way. No, you are not articulating anything of what the counterplan is doing. You never say like why exactly the counterplan is not enough. All you say is that it isn't. But whenever you cross the line, the counterplan solvency. Uh, what number is that? Two that shows how exactly we're perceived in the international community and like. Uh, Oh, sorry, that's, yeah, that's how we're avoiding it. Whenever you cross by the uh, first solvency argument on this, you're showing how the Federal Reserve System is, oh, oh, by, okay, by allowing this exception, you're going to still get the same effect. You're just going to avoid the domestic impacts that you're going to find within the United States. That is the counter plan in and of itself. If the counter plan is not enough to solve back for the international community, neither is the affirmative, meaning that you have to hold them to a double standard on that and gut check them on their warrants whenever they say it's not the same thing. On the next argument, you say, though, is that uh, without, uh, the, without, the, without the plan, then there's collapse is inevitable because uh, you control the union. Both of this has two things. First off, that is because people are generally going to pull out. That is the link to the, uh, that was the specific link to the financial markets dissent. You can cross by all of the investor stuff here. That's the specifically the second and the third warrant we give you, showing how the plan prevents people from uh, securitizing trade, but also how it decreases people from, like, it keeps people from, like, investing in a market. That's the scenario you're looking for in the status quo. That's what we're highlighting coming out of the dissent level that you're not handling. But second off, our counterplan solves absolutely 100% of this. You can group this argument with their next thing that they say, whatever they say, if the U European Union wants this. Cool. If the EU wants it, they'll be completely fine with the counterplan doing it. If no, then you have to gut check the affirmative of whether or not they're going to be able to satisfy the EU as well. Um. Next, they say on solvency, the economic power is key to check for hard power. A couple things. First off, you assume a lot in the PMC, especially whenever you're coming back here and saying that like we do a good thing, but whenever we show you how like the 2008 recession hurt us, thus it's key for like military stability. No, that's not a warranted analysis of what exactly is key to hard power or not. You're just simply making claims as to like what exactly the economy is going to do for, but more specifically, what this plan is going to do for the economy. You spe you specify nowhere in the PMC that you are increasing U.S. hegemony. Gut check them on this and look look back at the PMC and look at nowhere in their taxes they ever specify how they're increasing uh, hegemony. They only say like. The 2008 recession hurt, and another one would lead to an adoption of the one as another economic as another, another economic bias. Nowhere do they ever highlight that, uh, that not doing the plan would lead to that. The second argument, though, I want is that the uh, we are still able to solve back to the economic power through the counter plan because we are able to solve back to that. You don't articulate why the counter plan is solved. Get to the second. Next, you say the realism is inevitable with an impact of uh, the least agreeing tax and transition awards. First argument I want is that people make uh, challenges against the United States all the time. That is where you're getting your uniqueness from. This advantage, people are already challenging the United States, and that, that's not necessarily because our hegemony is decreasing. That's just because how realism operates. People are always going to try to push to make their country at the top of the level. You don't understand how realism is working in the international community and are making a lot of bold claims as to why your case is key to solve back to that. The second argument I want, though, is that realism, uh, whenever you're going to emphasize realism, I don't want that argument. Uh, the next thing that you say is that the 2008 recession hurt and it won't be worse. Two things. First off, again, this is not an articulation for hegemony being a key for it being a key factor. You can cross by my analysis here. But the second argument, though, is that you don't articulate what exactly uh, what exactly you're doing to prevent another recession. All you're, do all you're doing is talking about like how this is going to be key to like solve back for, I guess, a couple like banks to hold, uh, hold off of like more capital or something like that. I don't know. You're really not articulating anything except for like the plan is key. The affirmative is so vague. I want you to gut check them on every single warrant they're reading whenever all they're saying is like it's key to the international position because Greece and the Philippines want us to do it. Greece and the Philippines aren't the international community. You read no analysis for why Xi Jinping or like Vladimir Putin wants us to do the plan. There's no analysis on like why uh, Angela Merkel from, the, from Germany in the European Union wants us to do it. Just please gut check them on all their facts from the PMC on the counter plan. First, the counterinterpretation is that I am allowed to. Uh, okay, on counterinterpretation is even with a single legislation resolution, I am allowed to read a, a plan includes. I am allowed to read a counter plan that is inclusive of the plan. The uh, reason to prefer this is first off, debatability because allowing this is always going to be the uh, key to uh, debate any sort of specific topic because again, you're going to be uh, limiting us out of certain debates. You can cross by that analysis from the other theory shell. But the second, the second reason I want it is for uh, critical thinking. Uh, by allowing people, by allowing the negative to have a plan inclusive counter plan regardless of the debate, that is going always going to allow for critical thinking because it is allowing us to like pick out of certain positions and uh, and pick out of certain positions and learn about what. Is what it is that we're doing. The third one I want is the real world policy making because this is how politicians work. People do not just like look at a uh, look at a bill on face value and like pass it through Congress, uh, pass it through Congress as though it didn't matter. We are always allowed to pick out of certain uh, out of certain sections. That's why the Glass Steagall Act has been proposed three times in the past ten years. Um, on your on your uh, standards, first off, predictability because like there are like a hundred per hundreds of pages of the Glass Steagall Act. No, that's the 2013 version of the Glass Steagall Act. Like, Elizabeth Warren's new pro new proposed 21st century edition has seven sections that you can just read through. But the second argument that here is that we went through these pages, we went through all the different sections to fabricate. The, the fabricate the counter plan. That means that if anything, you have to hold them to the same standard that we are being held to to fabricate this argument in the first place. If we were able to figure this out, then you should have been able to figure it out on the affirmative. There's no loss of predictability or ground there because it's in the it's in the text of your own affirmative. Uh, it's in the text of your own affirmative subject. If you can't defend that, it sounds like your plan really doesn't have that much solvency. The next argument is that um. 
You said the negatives when percentage is going to be extremely high. However, this is a complete term because in, through your interpretation of like not necessarily of, of us not being allowed to run a pick on this, you're always going to turn the percentage to the affirmative because the negative is continually going to be pushed out of debate. That is going to be collapsed because negating is no longer fun for anybody and people will generally pull out of the program because they're simply not having fun. This immediately turns up and all the voters have already answered a priori and competitive interpretation on the other page. You can cross by that here. Next on the counterplay, you do not permit it whatsoever. You do not permit anything. You answered the specific instance saying there were other counterplay. Exactly. Oh yeah, you say like there are other counterpoints we could have read. One, don't make us read other things. Like if I wanted to read this, I'd probably find because of the standards I gave you earlier. But second, there's uh, okay. Is there anything else you need to say on that? I mean, like it doesn't matter. Other counterplan, like other counterplan ground, like would involve like yeah, other counterplan ground would like still involve other bits of the resolution. You can always let like, just like read a theory about that. Next, you don't really perm anything on the counterplan menu where you're, you're still able to garner 100 percent solvency from the counterplan that goes completely conceded. If you believe that we are allowed to read this counterplan, we win this debate on the dis ad. You say first off predictability output of the two percent. Okay, same thing. Gut check them on all their analysis. Same thing. Predictability is up two percent, two percent in December. But whenever you extend across the A sub point of the dis ad, it's showing how the financial market is stable on the status quo. That's our story. But your plan is going to super charge that and make people pull out. You're arguing uniqueness on a level that you are not understanding. The second argument, that you use, the second argument is you say it's not unique because the Federal Reserve is increasing its interest rate. I don't know what that means. You're not necessarily articulating what exactly that's going to have to do with investor confidence whatsoever. The third argument you say is that it's turned because you're going to decrease monopoly. You just kind of like got this out in like the last 10 seconds and seconds of the MGM. I don't know what, that's, I don't know what that means. If anything, I assume that like your plan uh, say destabilizing the market, leaving like the catastrophe that we highlight in the C subpoint that you can see outweighs that. start with the theory read on the stream act and then I'm going to go to the picks theory page uh, and then I'm going to go PMC disad which is the financial markets disad and then counterclaim so the theory read on disad uh, the pick theory PMC financial markets disad and then the counter plan. Uh, you have pens. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Is anyone not ready? Okay. UT Tyler GM wins this debate for a few main reasons. First, is they literally in the PMC do not tell you how they are increasing U.S. hegemony. But even if they did do that, the counter plan is going to solve back for that. I'll be, and I'll like touch on theory and like what we can run the counter plan. Second is that you should vote for us because we are net beneficial. We avoid the links to the disadvantage. So if you buy anything the affirmative is saying is about hegemony or anything like that, you should try to avoid the disadvantage so that we no longer have a giant like financial crash, which would collapse U.S. hegemony because we just wouldn't be able to function anymore and would lead to extinction, right? Uh, so you should vote on us or you should vote for us like through net benefits. Um, also, like just did the fact that there is a risk of the disadvantage happening, that means that you should err on the side of the negative because we have uh, like because of that. So we're winning on time frame because as soon as you do the affirmative, that is an immediate trigger because it stops people from being able to make uh, these provisions are still like in place. So it stops people from being able to do security trades, which is what uh, like closes out 38% of these big banks from being able to do things. Also, we're winning on magnitude because uh, like we are controlling the financial collapse scenario. If you uh, do the affirmative without taking out these provisions, then it is guaranteed we will at least lose $100 billion in profit. And then investors will freak out, continue to pull out and not make more risky investments which means that they aren't going to be increasing any uh, like capital in the economy anyway. And we're waiting on probability because the market is volatile now. They're literally just making it worse and we're not able to do things. So briefly on these theory pages, first on the decide theory, uh, just remember the like, What's that? Yeah, don't spend too long on this one. Just be like, look, politicians talk about things all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, politicians talk about things uh, all the time. So, like, the fact that, like, like there is a literature base in the fact that we are quoting, like, Mitch McConnell and people who have come out, like, talking about these bills in the actual disadvantage that we're reading. There's literally no abuse uh, happening here. So just remember to extend all of Seth's stuff. If they try to go for it in the PMR, they just remember... Huh? They don't impact it yeah, they're not impacting out. There's no like reason to vote for this. Uh, there's no abuse happening, and there is a literature base because we pulled from it to write the disadvantage. So if they get up and go for it in the PMR, it doesn't do them anything. Uh, the next, uh, the next interp sheet about uh, picks. First, just uh, remember to extend Seth's arguments if they get up and go for this in the PM uh, in the PMR. Just remember that we also had to go through this bill, right? We also had to go through it to uh, write the counter plan. So that's the same thing. Also, they lead to the collapse of debate because if uh, the affirmative can just say you can't read picks, you can't read politics as that, you can't read 
between uh, all of this like viable negative ground, then that means that neg teams will win like substantially uh, less than affirmative teams, and it will make people not want to debate. Yeah, like the, the, to articulate that the reason this theory is like bad is because like you spent like a minute thirty reading it, but that minute thirty probably would have been better spent. Yeah, the they spent a minute thirty reading it when they could have just spent a minute and thirty minutes or, or a minute and thirty seconds reading uh, like you no know, solvency to the counterplan and things like that. Like there was no abuse happening anyway, and like this uh, effectively shuts negative teams out of the debate. So on the PMC specifically, remember that challenge is inevitable, uh, like whether we're in a multipolar or a unipolar world, because people will want to uh, like have hegemony. People constantly uh, like take huge risks because they think there will be bigger payoff, right? And just remember, uh, they say the economy is like the key determinant uh, of hegemony. If you buy that argument, then you should probably vote for the negative because we avoid the uh, the disab, which leads to a collapse of financial markets because we no longer exclude that 38% of banks from uh, being able to uh, like use security trades. So go to the disadvantage. Uh, literally, they extend us arguments. Uh, they're very uh, extend us arguments that like this disab is actually going to happen. They don't have any like not unique on this. Uh, we are. This will lead to a failure of markets, which would be catastrophic, right? So uh, which would be catastrophic. They they say that investor confidence is good in the status quo, but the affirmative is not the status quo, right? They're changing it. What? Yeah, it's an easy ballot whenever you can see the counterplane solves 100% of the disad. Yeah, it's an easy ballot when you can see the counterplane solves 100% of the disad. Even if you don't buy the counterplane, the disad is still means that it's net beneficial to not vote for the affirmative. So even if you don't buy the counterplane, like uh, they're still excluding 38% of banks from uh, engaging in the security trade, which is a huge a huge amount of money that we would be losing. But on the counterplan, remember that we are solving because we are excluding these provisions that would cause this 38% of banks not to be able to. Counterplane is solving that, yeah. Yeah, counterplane is solving the disad. What have you dropped? Oh, tissues. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Here you go. What about the phone? Cases are these days. I already dropped my phone in the last edge of What's the for William Jewell FR when they've conceded that you're going for counterinterpretations and they don't actually have a counterinterpretation. Okay, so let's uh, look to both of the interpretations. So first we're saying that uh, when there's a single legislative option, they should not have a plan includes counter plan. Now they tried to get up and say that even with a single legislative option, they're allowed to read a plan-inclusive counterplan. Now, first of all, that is not a justification for why they get a plan-inclusive counterplan. So um, let's go through all of the standards. First of all, there's predictability. Now, we're saying that predictability is an internal link to their standards of debatability and critical thinking because we cannot spend all of our prep time predicting um, quality clash for every single uh, for every single predict uh, for every single provision of a bill. Now they try to say that this is an easily debatable bill that uh, because it only has seven sections. Now we're saying that this is a theory argument, right? It's an a priori issue. So it's not just about the Glass Steagall Act. Even though this uh, act may be small, it may have only seven sections. There are plenty of uh, there are plenty of uh, there are plenty of policy there are plenty of policy options that could be resolutions that that could be hundreds of pages, right? So this is about what's best uh, for debate as an activity, not just about what's uh, best for this specific debate round, right? So if they want to talk about debatability and critical uh, thinking. Point of order. Yes. I think that this is a recharacterization of the argument uh, at the point that on the flow I, s I have that you guys say the glass Eagle Act is hundreds of pages long and now you're saying that it's not about the glass Eagle Act, it's about other acts. So like I feel like this theory argument was massively recharacterized from being specific to being not specific. Okay, well, I'm responding to their uh, clarification that the Glass-Steagall Act is just a seven-second policy, a uh, seven-section policy. Moreover, my yeah. voters are about the effect that the interpretation has on debate as a whole. We're talking now about the effect that your counter-interpretation has on debate I as a whole. Okay, okay. I, I just think that it's a recap. I have enough. We can move on. Okay. okay. So if they are uh, so adamant about debatability and critical thinking, we're saying that predictability is going to be the internal link to both of those. So if we have to, as an affirmative team, uh, 
be able to uh, come up with the uh, best arguments to create quality clash um, in, in a debate round, uh, we should be able to predict the kind of, uh, the kind of negative arguments that they are going to read. Unfortunately, um, there are so many provisions that are available. Uh, th there are so many different provisions uh, in a single legislative option um, that they could pick out of that it is impossible for us to be able to come up with quality clash. So our standards are going to preclude theirs. Yes, the articulation about seven sections still doesn't like disprove abuse because having to formulate strategies for a pick for each of those seven sections still is a serious detriment to the affirmative. So uh, their argument that uh, just this seven section, um, it, that just this act having seven sections still does not uh, disprove abuse because seven sections are still like seven different picks that they could have come up with, which is still uh, is still a prep skew, still a strat skew, and still and still a time skew against affirmative teams in this round, uh, which only magnifies in other rounds, uh, which could have hundred, uh, hundreds of pages uh, for his, yes. The impacts of strat skew, time skew, and whatever the other one was are not articulated to the PMR. The only standards I have are predictability and negative percentage, and the voters are operating priori competitive, competitive interpretations. I'm sure it's under consideration. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, now next, on to, um, on to specifically... Uh, checking for negative bias. Okay, so they have. Uh, so we're saying that uh, negative bias. Uh, this it so that uh, our interpretation is key to checking a negative bias uh, because it's key to AF participation uh, and uh, AF flexibility because um, our ability uh, to participate in these debate rounds in which um, we are not able to. Uh, look some of their arguments specifically on uh, the counter plan, you can take note of these on, on your flow. We were not able to perm this counter plan because any perm that we would have on this would be severance or intrinsic. So, uh, like, and that those were the exact arguments that they were making on uh, on the counter plan. So, right, like, yeah. Sorry, go. On. Yeah. So, like, what we're saying here is that it pretty much uh, it pretty much like takes the affirmative out of the round and it takes our affirmative flex uh, like strategic flexibility. Um, away from the round, which like pretty much kills all app participation, um, in which uh, like their interpretation um, of like negatives are uh, rewarded for reading uh, plan inclusive counter plans on single legislative options. It pretty much like makes it so if they want to talk about how it's not fun for people to be in rounds, and then when it's not fun for people to be in rounds, um, then they quit the activity. So like if we're going to evaluate on competing interpretations in which people start quitting the activity, then it's more likely that their interpretation causes people to quit the activity. So um, it's more likely that their interpretation is bad for debate as a whole. Now, I have two things. Yes. Sorry, the next thing is that means that we control the uniqueness on the question of the negative teams winning. That means that we control the uniqueness on the question of negative teams winning uh, because it's more likely that um, people uh, operating under their interpretation are uh, going to, if, if, yeah, it's more likely that people operating under their interpretation are going to see more uh, more negative teams winning, particularly because uh, the negative is always going to have a bias in which the affirmative is going to be pushed out of the round because it is going to be impossible for them to predict what the negative strategy is going to be. The last be. thing they say it's key to real world policy making. In the real world, you have more than 20 minutes to engage. Right, and they say it's key to real world policy making. However, in the real world, you have more than 20 minutes uh, to like evaluate or predict exactly what the um, exactly what. But, yeah, the other team is going to, it, exactly what they're going to say. Good round. Good round. Uh, I have like a cold, so I've been trying not to contaminate the candidate. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Good, good, good round. Thank you. Oh my God, I'm going to hear myself. Thank you, too. <laughs>